Hi, I'm Ben Baez, and I'm an intern with the student ministry here at Southport Church. Today's scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 24. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very reason I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills. You will say to me then, Why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles? May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Ben. Good morning. Some of you thought Jonathan just preached and we were done. Sorry. You're stuck with me. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 9, uh, that passage that Ben just read. And uh, I too want to say happy Father's Day to you dads, uh, both here in the room and also watching online. Just so appreciate what you do to uh, invest in your families. And I said this last night to our Saturday night crew I just said, you know, somebody told me years ago, the best gift that we as dads can give our kids is for us to love, follow, and be a faithful disciple of Jesus. So dads, whether you get some gifts today or not, give your family the gift of you following faithfully after Jesus. And uh, your family will be blessed, uh, you will be blessed, and God will be glorified. So uh, happy Father's Day. Uh, So we're in this series uh, called Secure. We're walking through Romans 8 to 11, just a few weeks left. Uh, Last week, we we covered the first part of chapter 9, uh, verses 1 to 13, where Paul talked about uh, God's sovereignty over salvation. Uh, Simply put, uh, Paul said, hey, if it weren't for God choosing to save us, there isn't one of us who would ever choose God. And so let me just quickly review a couple of things that we talked about last week. Uh, First, uh, from verses 1 to 5, Paul demonstrated, really by his own grief for his own people, the Jewish people, how God's sovereignty should never extinguish a heart for the lost. Uh, Even though God draws and calls people to himself, that doesn't give us an excuse as Christ followers to not share our faith and not share the gospel or even not to have a heart for those who don't know him. In fact, Paul demonstrated by his own grief for many of the Jewish people who had rejected Jesus, he demonstrated that we are to have a heart for the lost. You should, I should, we should. Now, the the fact that there are some Jewish people who did not embrace Jesus, that raises another question, doesn't it? Because aren't they God's people? Uh, Weren't they born of Abraham? So doesn't that mean they're just automatically children of God? And so what Paul did in verses 6 to 8 is he reminded us, or better yet clarified for us, that one's family tree does not guarantee one's salvation. And that's a good reminder for all of us as well. Just because someone is a physical descendant of Abraham doesn't automatically make them spiritual children of God. And what Paul does down in verses 10 to 13, he really unpacks this It talks about God's choice of Isaac over Ishmael. God's choice of Jacob over Esau. And one of the things that we saw, again, verses 10 to 13, was God's choice wasn't based on their behavior, their their goodness, their morality, or their works. It was based on God's choice. In fact, look at verses 10 to 13. Let me just read a couple of these verses. This is speaking of Jacob. It said, And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, uh, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she, she was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. 
See, one thing that we need to remember is that God's choice, God's grace towards any of us, it's not contingent upon our goodness. And that's a really good thing because Romans 3 says there's none of us who are good. There's none of us who seek after God. Therefore, our salvation, it's not dependent upon us and our goodness. It's dependent upon God and His grace. And this is why elsewhere in Scripture, several places, we are told we have no room to boast in our salvation. I mean, think about this. If our salvation was dependent upon our goodness, then we would have reason for a little spiritual pride. We could feel really good about ourselves. But the fact that salvation is dependent upon God in His goodness, in His grace, we have no room for pride. Instead, we just stand amazed and humbled by God's grace and His mercy and His sovereign choice. And this is why Paul in Ephesians 2, very famous verse, For by grace you have been saved by faith. It's not of your works, it's not your doing. He says it's a gift of God. So we have no room for boasting. All right, so that's what we did last week. And if that was all we covered in chapter 9, many of you would say, praise God, let's get to chapter 10. But we got the second half. And like I told you last week when we started this, man, there, there is, these truths are really hard to wrap our minds around. Many of you probably, probably left last week with more questions than you, than you had answers. And I totally get that because teachings and doctrines such as these, they're deep, they're rich, in many ways they're mysterious. Remember how I ended last week, Paul's words in Romans chapter 11, verse 33? This is after Paul, chapters 8 to 11, he covers this, 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 uh, these chapters on God's sovereignty. Here's what he said. Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable are his ways. Let's remember, God is big. God is infinite. We as human beings, we are small. We are finite. Therefore, as finite human beings, we will never fully be able to wrap our minds around an infinite God. In some ways, we need to be okay with that. And we need to choose to trust him. Now, th this doesn't mean that we need to always just quickly, you know, punt to mystery. You know what I mean by that? So sometimes we come to passages in scripture, doctrines, teachings, and, and they're hard. And we're like, well, we don't understand. So, you know, that's mystery. Let's not even talk about it. Let's just punt. Let's not think about it, wrestle with it. No, don't do that. Y yes, there comes a point when we, when we can't understand that we got to go, okay, God, you're God, I'm not. That's mysterious but we should always seek to understand the truth about who God is and how he operates. However, because he is God, there is an element of mystery. Who he is, how he, how he does operate. And again, we need to be okay with that. I love uh, Moses' words to the people of Israel, Deuteronomy 29, 29, where he says, the secret things belong to God, mystery, but the things revealed belong to us. So yes, we need to trust God's sovereignty, even when it comes to our salvation. It's okay to wrestle. It's okay to have questions. We should. We need to take those to God. But at the end of the day, we need to let God be God. And we need to trust that in all things, especially those things we don't understand, we need to trust that God is good. We just sang about that. God is good. And the reason that's so important for us to understand, especially as we go into the second half of chapter 9, is because coming out of these first 13 verses, we wrestle with this idea of God's goodness a little bit. We just heard last week about how God chose Isaac, not Ishmael, Jacob, not Esau. And so what happens is we start going, well, God, how is that even fair? In fact, look at verse 14. Uh, Paul assumes that this is a question we ask, and here's how he, he, he phrases it. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? So what Paul's going to do, the, the latter half here of chapter 9, is he's going to address this question, 
And by addressing this question, what he's going to do is give us some key insights and truths about God's mercy. And so let's just, let's just spend some time going through verses 14 to 29, uh, looking at what can we learn about God's mercy? What can we learn about God's person and the way he does operate? All right, so verse 14 again. Here's the question. Paul says, okay, so, so what shall we say uh, then? Is there injustice on God's part? And notice how Paul answers here. Verse 14, he says, by no means. Now, in, in English, that just seems like no. In Greek, that's like incredibly emphatic. That's like Paul saying, no, 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 no way. Absolutely not. There is never any injustice with God. And one of the reasons Paul is so emphatic with thinking that there's injustice with God, him saying no, is because as human beings, what do we naturally do? When something doesn't make sense or when something from our perspective of human beings, it's not clear, we don't understand, what do we do? We say, well, God, that's not fair. And one of the reasons we go there and go there so quickly is because we think or we assume that God is like us. I mentioned this last week. Let me say it again, and let me say it very clearly. God is not like us. Isaiah 55, the Lord himself said, My thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, he says, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts than your thoughts. In Psalm chapter 50, God is patient with his people. They're they're rebelling, they're sinning. And it says God's patient with them, wanting them to repent. But God's people are taking God's, is taking God's patience as God's not going to do what he said he's going to do. And so God rebukes them. And in Psalm 50 verse 21, he makes this statement. He says to his people, you thought that I was one like yourself. God's not like us. See, one challenge we have as finite human beings is we often think that he is. He's not. Uh, unfortunately, what's happened today, even for those of us who are Christ followers, w- we have a way of sort of making God into our own image, and we forget that we are the ones who are made in his image. So, so in some ways, we, we are like God because we reflect his image, but let's never think that God is like us. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And because this is true, we, we, we struggle when we don't understand why God does what he does. And so Paul knows this. So again, verse 14, he addresses this question. Well, God, how's that fair? God, God, you choosing to save some and not others. God, isn't that unjust? And so look at how Paul answers his question. Verse 15. He says, uh, this is Paul speaking, For he, God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Now, interestingly, Paul points to an experience that Moses has with God in Exodus 33. You can go back and read it later. And what Moses does is he says, God, show me your glory. God, show me who you are. And check out, I'm going to read, this is Exodus 33, verse 19. Here's how God responds to Moses. God says, I will make all of my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And then here's what Paul quotes. And I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Now, the reason Paul points to this experience in Moses' life is because this experience, what God says here, God reveals an aspect of his character that is core to who he is. And the aspect of his character that he reveals is his freedom. His freedom to do as he pleases to do. By the way, that's the essence of what it means to be God, right? That's the essence of what it means to to be sovereign. You're free. God is free to do as he pleases. 
Now, if God is like us, we've got a big issue. Because if there's one thing that history has taught us, it's when any one human being or even a group of people, when they have ultimate freedom and authority and power with no accountability, when they are free to do as they please, no accountability, that seldom, if ever, ends well. And, and, and that's true for the, even the best of us. In fact, one trend, one trend that we are seeing in churches today is pastors, lead pastors, senior pastors, who have all authority, they have no accountability. They've either started their church with no leadership accountability or they've disbanded the accountability that they had. And so we are seeing more and more these, these leaders, these pastors who have all authority and power and freedom to do as they please. And as a result, they are misusing and abusing their power. And so as a result, they're leaving in their wake destruction. Instead of loving their people, they're manipulating them. Instead of serving them, they're, they're, they're seeking to control them. That's what happens when we are free to do as we please with no accountability. But what Paul is saying here and referring to here is not a human being. He's referring to God. And he reminds us by pointing back to Moses that God, in the essence of being God, he has the freedom and the right to do as he pleases. So look at verse 15 again. God has a right, verse 15, to say, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Now, at first glance, that seems a bit harsh. But not the mercy part, but when you think of the opposite of that. But when we, when we really understand what it means to have mercy, it really helps us understand what, what, what God's saying here. <clears throat> let, let, let me give you an example of mercy. I hope this helps. Uh, so when I was a, a senior in college, about to finish up my college life, uh, I and a, a few friends put off uh, an, uh, a core class that we all needed to have. Uh, it was art and humanities. And as you can probably tell by looking at me, I'm not an art and humanities kind of guy. Uh, and so we put this off to our very last semester. And man, I struggled to even get a B in this class. And so as, as final exams came and graduation was not far off, uh, I took about a week and a half, me and these buddies of mine, and we studied like crazy for our art and humanities exam. And while we were studying, a, a guy that we sort of knew, sort of an acquaintance, he was in the art and humanities class, but a different hour, he, he came to us and he said, hey, I have a review sheet that I want to give you guys, if y'all want it, just to, to, to review and to study for the exam. And we were like... Yeah, we, we need all the help we can get. We'll take it. And so we took this review sheet, and for like, you know, four or five days, we just, I devoured it. And so test day comes. We go in. We, we sit down, and me and my buddies were in the same class, and the professor comes, and he passes out our tests. And about three questions in, I realize what has happened. The guy who gave us a review sheet, actually, we find out later, stole a test from the professor, made copies, and passed them out to a lot of people, myself included. And so I, I finished my, my exam. I went out in the hallway, met up with my buddies, and we all looked at each other and said, what do we do? We, we just unknowingly cheated on that test. And so we decided, we said, well, we know what we have to do. We need to tell the professor what happened. And so that night, we go to our professor's house. We sit with him, and I'll never forget this. We're, three of us are on one side of the living room. He's on the other side, and we explain what happened. And what he did, how he responded, shocked us because he didn't give us what we deserved. Instead, he showed mercy. He said to us, he said, you know, I have every right to fail you. I have every right to even have you expelled. He said, but that's not what I'm going to do. He said, because you came to me, because you were honest, I'm going to let you keep the grade that you made on the test. Again, we were shocked. It's not what we deserved. But that's what he did. And you know what that's called? It's called mercy. Now, somebody asked me, so what did you make, what did you make on that test? Like 100? I went, no, I made like a, barely made a B. <laughs> and they're like, you had the exact test and you still couldn't at least make an A? Different story for a different day, all right? 
Here's my point. God being merciful means that God, when he has every right to punish us, he doesn't punish us. But instead he blesses us. God's mercy means that when what we deserve because of our sin is condemnation, God's mercy means that he withholds it. And, and, and so mercy by its very definition is never an obligation. Therefore, to say mercy is unfair is to imply that mercy is owed us. Let me be very clear on this. God does not owe us mercy. God doesn't owe us anything. God doesn't owe us grace. God doesn't owe us salvation. In fact, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute, God would be completely just and righteous to let us face the condemnation that our sin deserves. In fact, look at verse 16. This is why uh, Paul reiterates here, uh, speaking of our salvation, it depends not on human will or exertion, or anything that we might want or strive for, but it depends on God's mercy. Uh, Tim Keller, in his commentary on Romans, puts it this way. He says, since the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23, that's what we deserve. Since the wages of sin is death, the shock is not that God does not extend his mercy to everyone, but the shock is that God extends his mercy to anyone. See that? And to make this even clearer, Paul goes, okay, I just talked about Moses, the leader of God's people. Let me shift and talk about Pharaoh, the leader of the Egyptians. The one, the one who oppressed God's people and would not let his people go. So look at verses 17 and 18. Paul says, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all of the earth. So then, Watch this. He has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. That's pretty clear. It's pretty pretty difficult as well, right? This again, remember, this speaks of God's sovereignty. And the fact that God, as God, has the freedom to do as he pleases. And what does it say here about Pharaoh? What is God pleased to do? God is pleased to use Pharaoh to spotlight his glory in his name. Now, if we're honest, look at, look at verse 18 again. This last part of this phrase is what stub, causes us to stumble a little bit. It says, so then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Pharaoh, especially in this context, is a great example of how God's sovereignty relates to human responsibility. See, a lot of times people, when they talk about God's sovereignty over salvation, you you can go to extremes big time. And so here's what some people do. They go, well, God is God is so sovereign that we're not, we have no accountability or responsibility for our choices as human beings. God just fixes everything and we're we're out of the picture. Or you go the other way and you go, well, we are completely free that God just responds. He doesn't know what we're going to do. He just responds to what we do. See the extremes? Here's the reality. The Bible teaches both God's sovereignty as well as our responsibility as human beings for our choices. And that's what we see here with Pharaoh. And it all actually hinges, look at verse 18 again, on this idea of God's hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Now, <clears throat> interestingly, Exodus 4 to 14, where you read about Pharaoh and Moses, this encounter, you know, God's wanting to lead his people out, Pharaoh's not letting them go. On several occasions, it says in Exodus 4 to 14 that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. But there's also times where it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And so somehow, okay, mystery, both are true. See, here's what, a, here's what a lot of people think when they read this phrase that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. A, a lot of people think, well, Pharaoh was this like really nice, jolly old fella, a really good guy whom God came along and just turned evil. Man, that is not what Scripture teaches us about Pharaoh. He opposed God. He opposed God's people. Read Exodus chapter 1. He tried to eradicate the Jewish people from the face of the earth even. 
And, and so don't think for a second that Pharaoh was like some swell guy that God came along and made hard. That, that's not what this teaches. One commentator put it this way, and I think this helps us understand this. He says, when God hardens someone, he doesn't create the hardness. He simply allows the person to go his or her own way. Meaning, God hardens those he wants to harden, and all those he hardens, they want to be hardened. Now you say, well, well, help me, help me understand that. Well, let's take it off of Pharaoh for a second. Let's just keep it in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1. You ever read Romans chapter 1? Man, Paul starts this book and he talks in verse 18 about God's wrath is being poured out on all unrighteousness and the ungodliness of men. And Paul talks about people with lustful hearts, dishonorable passions, people with a debased mind, people who want nothing to do with God. Paul says they just want to do their own thing, live their own life. And so later on in the chapter, down in verse 24, 26, and 29, here's what Paul says. He said, so these people just want to do their own thing. So it says God gave them over. Verse 24, he gave them over to their lustful hearts. Verse 26, he gave them over to dishonorable passions. Verse 29, Paul says God just gave them over to a debased mind. You know what that means, that God gave them over? It means God said, okay, I'm going to let you do what you want to do. God giving them over is God giving them to what they most wanted. And that's what we find here with Pharaoh. When it talks about God hardening Pharaoh's heart, it simply means that God was giving Pharaoh over to his own stubbornness. Pharaoh had already had a hard heart. He hardened his own heart. And so God hardening his heart is God reinforcing what Pharaoh himself already chose. And this is important for us to understand. God's sovereignty does not negate human responsibility. Please understand that. However, because we are depraved, because we are sinful and fallen creatures, and we talked about this last week, Left to ourselves, we, none of us, on our own, apart from God's intervention in any way, we would never choose to love God, follow Him, or surrender to Him. We would only oppose Him. And this is why we got to be careful when we think about or talk about free will. Because a lot of times when we talk about God's sovereignty, here's what people think. Well, God's sovereignty then means that God forces people to do what they don't want to do. That's not what the Bible teaches about God's sovereignty. Now, when we talk about God's sovereignty over salvation, it's actually in a positive note because basically what we are saying is, is God's sovereignty over salvation means that God does not leave us to ourselves and our sins, but God intervenes to save us from ourselves. And that's why as Christians, this, when we read this stuff, we got to go, oh, God, thank you. God, I'm humbled. I'm grateful. See, God hardening Pharaoh's heart was God not making Pharaoh hard. He was already hard. His heart was hard. God was giving him over to what he already wanted. And this is why as human beings, we're responsible. This is why we're accountable to God. Because again, left to ourselves, we would never choose to love God. Or run to God. Or follow Him. Now, Paul... Comes back, look at verse 19. He knows what people are thinking. They just heard him say, well, God hardens whomever he hardens. He has mercy on whomever he he has mercy. And so verse 19, Paul knows the questions that people are going to ask. He says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Now, uh, to this point, Paul's kind of interacted and said, okay, I know your questions. Here's the answers. Now, here, Paul's going to shift a little bit. Because he's going to get very direct, he's going to get very blunt, so as to say, okay, I I hear your questions, hey, I understand your objections, this is really hard stuff, but he goes, here's what it comes down to. Let me me just summarize it, then I'll show you in the text. He's going to say, hey, let, let, let me remind you that we as human beings, we are created by God, 
therefore we are not God. Let me say that again. We as human beings, we are created by God. We are creation. Therefore, we are not God. We, we are not the creator. Uh, we need to constantly be reminded that we are not God. We wish we were. We, 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 we want to do what we, we want to do. But Paul says that's, that's not who we are. Look at verses 20 to 21. I just said it the very nice way. Here's how Paul says it. But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? It's pretty bold of Paul, isn't it? He's like, Seeing that God created you, remember God has the right and the freedom to do as he pleases. Now, we, woo, that makes us uncomfortable, right? We don't like that. that we feel like that infringes on our, our freedoms, our, 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 our rights. M many of us, we, we, we feel like that God owes us very clear, detailed reasons to do what he does, but he doesn't. He, he's, he's God. We are not. He's the creator. We are creation. Now, please don't hear me saying that we don't need to, to go to God with our questions, our doubts, our fears, our frustrations. We do. We're, we're welcome to do that. In fact, this is why I love the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is full of, of, of the most intimate journals of some of God's most faithful followers. They, they are real with God. They're authentic. They, they lay it out before God. And we should do the same. However, there comes a point when we seek God and we, we lay all that before God when we still don't understand, when we can't wrap our minds around why God is doing what he, He's doing, there comes a point where we need to step back and say, okay, God, you're God and I'm not. In fact, this is what God had to eventually say to Job. You know, for 37 chapters, Job is wrestling, he's struggling, he's suffering, he's trying to make sense of it. And beginning in chapter 38 to, to chapter 41, God finally says, okay, Job, I, I've heard you. But Job, let, let me remind you who is God. And it's not you. You ever read chapters 38 to 41? Let me, do, let me just share with you a couple of verses of what God says to Job. So this is Psalm, uh, or rather Job 38.2. Here's what God says to him. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man, and I will question you, and you will make it known to me. Chapter 38, verse 4. God says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Verses 12 and 13. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it may take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? See what God's doing? I, I don't think he's reprimanding him. I think he's reminding Job, Job, I am God. And I think it's a good reminder for us to constantly be brought back to the reality that God is God. We are not. He is. And we can trust Him. We may not understand His ways. We may not understand why He does what He does. But we can trust Him. We need to trust Him. And because He's God, again, He's got the right to do as He pleases. Now, pick up at verse 22. Paul says, What if God, desiring to show His wrath... And to make known his power, what if God has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Now, go, go to verse 22. Notice what it says here. It says that God endured with patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. 
Uh, in the context, I think, just if you go back to verses 1 and 5, I think that's probably referring to unbelieving Jews. Jews whom God was patient with and their disobedience, their rebellion. In fact, in the context, it seems to say that it was their disobedience and their rebellion that made them vessels of wrath. And notice, notice what it says. Rather, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that God prepared them for destruction. It says, rather, God was patient with them. Which means unbelievers are prepared for destruction by themselves. Again, God gives them over to do what they want. But hear me, when God gives us over to do what we want, where does that always lead? Destruction. Now, compare that with verse 30, or, or rather 23. Because here, Paul is very clear. And he says, vessels of mercy God has prepared beforehand. John Stott, famous British scholar, put it this way. He says, if anybody is lost, the blame is theirs. If anybody is saved, the credit is God's. And so if you take verses 22 to 23 and all that, that, that Paul says here, essentially what he's saying is God shows His mercy in the riches of His glory. God is glorified both by showing mercy as well as dispensing justice. So what, what, what's justice? Justice is receiving what we deserve, right? What's mercy? Mercy is receiving what we don't at all deserve. Now, all of us in here pretty much would say together, we would say, okay, God's, God's mercy, you know, God dispensing mercy, yes, that glorifies God. We love it when God is merciful. But when we think about God's justice in giving us or anybody what we deserve, we struggle to think how that glorifies God. But it does. Let, let, me, let me give you a, a practical example of this. So let's assume that someone uh, it, it commits murder, uh, they're on trial for murder, and they are convicted. And they stand before a judge in the judicial system. They stand before a judge, and the judge looks at this, this murderer, and he says, because of your heinous crime, uh, your sentence is life in prison without parole. Now, we all would look at that judge and go, that is good justice, right? He is a good, righteous judge. He gave that murderer what he deserved, life in prison. And in many ways, that judge's ruling would bring glory, if you will, or praise to that judge. Well, the same is true in God's economy. Follow me on this. God is absolutely glorified when he, when he shows mercy by saving any of us. But God is also glorified by dispensing justice and giving sinners what they deserve. 2 Peter chapter 2, I think it's verse 4. It says, God did not spare the angels when they sinned. Maybe this is why Peter, I think it's in 1 Peter, Peter says, the angels are in awe of our salvation. You ever thought about maybe the reason the angels are in awe of, of God's grace and His mercy towards us as human beings is because they saw that God gave the fallen angels what they deserve, but yet He showed mercy to us. God is glorified by showing mercy, yes, but He's also glorified by dispensing justice. He's a good, righteous judge. And then, here's what Paul does just off of that. He goes verses 24 to 29 and says, hey, by the way, God's mercy... It goes to both Jews and Gentiles. God's kingdom will be made up of Jews and Gentiles. In fact, he quotes from the prophet Hosea as well, the prophet Isaiah, verses 25 and 26 from Hosea, where it says that, you know, those who are not my people will be called my people, referring to the Gentiles. And then in verses 27 and 28, especially how Paul started by his grief over the many Jews who do not believe, he quotes from Isaiah and saying, hey, don't worry, God will show mercy to a remnant. In verse 29, again from Isaiah, he says that's a good thing that God showed mercy because if God did not show mercy towards his people, they would have ended up like Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? 
exhibit A of God's righteous judgment towards sin. It's heavy stuff, isn't it? But I warned you. <laughs> when we started this chapter, I said, listen, this is heavy stuff. It's deep truths. And, I, and I've heard from some of you this week, oh man, I've never heard that. Some of, you, some of you said, I've heard it, but I've never wrestled with it. But we should. We need to. Because even though God is infinite and we are finite, and even though as finite human beings, we will never be able to fully wrap our minds around God in His ways, we need to seek to understand God. God wants us to know Him. Jeremiah chapter 9 says, Thus says the Lord, man, let not the, the, the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the mighty man boast of his might, or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices love and justice and righteousness. We should always seek to know God. He wants us to know Him. And so wherever you find yourself this morning, whether these, these truths resonate with you, whether you're going to leave here this morning like you did last week with more questions than answers, whether you think I'm completely crazy for not skipping chapter 9, wherever you find yourselves, let me just offer some final thoughts of some truths about God and truths about us that I think we all agree on and we all can be amazed by. All right, so three things. Here's the first. In light of all that Paul said, not just here in chapter 9, but also in chapter 8, here's the first. Let's acknowledge that God is more sovereign and more merciful than we ever dared imagine. Can we just acknowledge that together? However big, sovereign, mighty, and merciful that you think God is, He's more. There's nothing in all of creation that will ever happen that falls outside the scope of God's sovereignty. And the fact that what we all deserve because of our sin is condemnation, the fact that God chooses to save any of us, that should humble us. That should amaze us. I've dialogued with different people going, man, it sounds like you're, 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 you're convinced of your, your, your understanding of the doctrine of election, things like that. I'm like, I think I know what I believe, but I wrestle. I struggle. I'm not God. And, and I'm convinced no matter how much debate or discussion we have, we, we, again, we will never be able to fully wrap our minds around this. And again, that's okay because we're not God. Uh, Melissa Kruger uh, wrote this in her blog. She said, just because I don't understand how something can be so does not mean it's not so. It simply means that my understanding is insufficient. Surely, she says, God can be and act in ways outside of our ability to comprehend. Why? Because He's God. And we're not. So, let me, let me just summarize that. Is God's sovereignty mysterious? Yes. Is God's sovereignty incomprehensible? Of course. But is God's sovereignty also wonderful? Absolutely. God is more sovereign and merciful than we ever dared imagine. Here's the second thing. This applies to us. And this is not original with me, but this, this applies to us. Here it is. We as human beings, we are more sinful and flawed than we ever dared believe. Again, this is why I think many people struggle, not, not everybody, but many people struggle with this teaching. We, we tend to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We, we actually think that we're good. We, we actually think that left to ourselves, oh, I, I will figure this out. I will seek God. It, therefore, we need to come back and we need to think of ourselves accurately, biblically. So, so let me just give you a couple examples of what the Bible, Bible says. The Bible says as human beings, we're sinful. We're fallen. We're, we're flawed. We're, we're broken. We're helpless. We, we're, we are in need of a, of a Savior. Uh, Romans 3, listen to Paul's words, verses 10 to 12. He says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. 
All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And then a few verses later, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let's never forget that we are more sinful and flawed than we ever dared believe. But here's the good news of the gospel. You ready? And we'll end on this one. We are more loved and accepted than we ever dared hope. In spite of our sin and our depravity, in spite of the fact that left to ourselves, we would never choose God. In spite of that, God has chosen to love us, show mercy towards us, and show grace. Instead of giving us what we deserve because of our sin, God instead gave us what we most desperately needed, and that is a Savior, and His name is Jesus. And it's only through Jesus that any of us can be reconciled to God, forgiven, and saved from ourselves. And so if you are a Christ follower, if you, you are a Christian, be amazed at God's mercy. Be humbled by it. Stand in awe. And if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ, but this morning you, you, you are convicted of your sin, you, you feel God drawing you to himself, give your life to him. Confess your sin. Trust Jesus to save you from yourself. Do you pray with me? <clears throat> Father God, we are so thankful for your mercy and your grace. God, when what we deserve is, is, is sin, or, or rather death and condemnation because of our sin, the fact that you showed mercy, God, that humbles us. May we always be humbled. May we never have spiritual pride thinking that our salvation is, is, is dependent upon us, but may we be humbled by the reality that it's all because of you and your mercy. God, I pray for those of us who are Christ followers, may we, th though we wrestle with teachings like this, may, may we be faithful to press in to know you, to know your heart as much as we can to know your ways. God, may we live lives of gratitude for your mercy. And God, I do pray for anyone here in this room or even watching online who feels that pull, who sees that they're a sinner this morning. God, I pray that you would save them, bring them to faith. Even now, would they confess their sin, acknowledge their need for a Savior, and acknowledge that you provided that Savior in Jesus. God, above all people, we have every reason to celebrate and to be thankful because, God, you saved us when we couldn't save ourselves. So we want to worship you and give you all the glory and all the honor this morning. And we do it because of Jesus. Amen.